Hello, and welcome to day three of Triumph 2.0, India's largest diversity and inclusion event. After some extremely inspiring sessions over the course of the first two days of the event, we are back for day three with informative discussions revolving around women in workplace. Women all throughout the world are strong economic actors, daily overcoming barriers based on gender to achieve economic security for themselves, their households, and their communities. Women's economic empowerment could be greatly enhanced by policies and investments that give them more control over their careers and financial situations. Investors often seem to hold inadvertent and unconscious bias against female entrepreneurs, believing that they are less likely to be successful entrepreneurs as compared to their male counterparts. Things could and should change. This brings us to the next part of our session, where we sit down with Ishita Verma, the co-founder and COO of Club, in a fireside chat discussing what it takes to succeed as a women entrepreneur. To moderate this session and introduce our speaker, we have Meeta Karan joining us. Meeta is Vice President at Monster, leading the Assisted Search Business Vertical. She brings with her 12 plus years of rich experience in strategy, operations, entrepreneurship, and commercial excellence. Prior to Monster, Meeta was VP Special Projects at Quest Corp and worked on building another HR tech business. She has previously worked with McKinsey across the globe in strategy, operations, transformations, and business turnarounds. She was also part of the coveted commercial leadership program at GE, energy and had a technology career before that, building simulation models at GE Aviation. She has also dabbled in entrepreneurship in the deep tech space and is an angel investor and mentor to startups. Meeta has been very passionate about the cause of women in the workplace and led the women's network for GE Aviation in Bangalore. She was also the women in commercial lead for GE India between 2008 to 2012. Meeta holds an MBA from INSEAD at France and a BE in Industrial Engineering from RV College of Engineering, Bangalore. With that, I hand over the floor to you, Meeta. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Triumph 2.0, India's largest diversity and inclusion event and career fair. I hope you've been enjoying the many inspiring conversations we've had so far for you with very, very eminent leaders. Our theme for today is unleashing women power. And what better way to celebrate that than by celebrating women entrepreneurs. We have with us today one such trailblazer who's created a unique fintech company in India called Club, Ishita Verma. Ishita Verma is the founder and CEO of Club, COO of Club, and provides revenue-based financing uh, to businesses without diluting their equity. Prior to this, Ishida has built other startups in the edtech and fintech space. She was also a VP at Snyder UAE, where she led fund structuring, fund launch setup, and guiding investment operations for five investment funds. Ishita was the youngest leader to head the financial inclusion and fintech practice at Unitas Capital, one of Asia's largest impact-focused investment bank. She has also worked with Kotak Institutional Equities, where she advised hedge funds, mutual funds, and private equity funds across Hong Kong, Singapore, London, and India on their India investment strategy. Welcome, Ishita, and thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited for the conversation. Great. So let's just dive in. Uh, let's begin. Uh, you've had an interesting journey. You're, a, you're I would say, a young achiever, uh, and we're really, we're really uh, glad to get you to share your insights on your entrepreneurial journey. As I said, Club is not your first startup. Uh, and you've done a couple of others before. Seems like the entrepreneurial bug has been there for a while and uh, you've, you've like jumped into it head on a couple of times. How did that happen? How did you get uh, inspired to go on this path of entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, my journey with entrepreneurship, rather my interest in entrepreneurship began very early. Uh, in fact, right back in college, when I was finishing my MBA um, from IIM Bangalore, one of the things that 
used to passionately excite me being in Bangalore was the startup ecosystem. Um, I am Bangalore had a very interesting ecosystem where, you know, the NS Raghavan Center for Entrepreneurship funds startups. I was involved with that program. So the bug was very, early. like I was bitten really early. Like I would say back in 2010. I also realized it's a very uh, interesting but challenging journey, which means that before I can actually start up, I need to learn a lot more. I was mm. a really green kid back then. So I needed to learn. I need to build uh, not only myself, but uh, my understanding of the industry, my personal finances. I mean, there's a lot that needed to happen before I could um, do justice to yeah. uh, building a startup. And the environment was very different then. You know, funding is thankfully much easier now. And a lot has changed in the last uh, 10 odd years for me. But back in 2010, when I was making the decision, I decided to first learn the ropes in the industry which led to, you know, the careers you kind of talk about in your introduction. And when I thought the time had arrived and, you know, for different people, that journey is different, but I felt financially, emotionally, mentally uh, ready for the next mm. phase of my career um, after working for like, you know, eight, 10 odd years, uh, I started up. The goal was always to do something that, you know, is a little bit socially motivated as well as mm. intellectually challenging. Um, so my first startup was in the tech space where we helped uh, mostly undergrads uh, upskill and land jobs as engineers and software engineers. So it was an upskilling uh, job. We specifically focused on tier two, tier three environments where college uh, education needs to be supplemented with out of college training to uh, mm -hmm. make these uh, you know young people uh, better employable and get uh, jobs that do justice to their passion. Um, so I, 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 and my co-founder still runs that startup. They're doing phenomenally well. They've raised the round. I think and I started deeply exploring the ecosystem, one of the things I was also very passionate about was the entrepreneurship ecosystem in India. And yeah. not as a traditionally, you know, we only think of tech startups. But entrepreneurship mm. is just so much broader than tech startups, right? If you think about Flipkart, the number of small e-commerce sellers it has given rise to. If you think of Swiggy, the number of cloud kitchen, uh, you know, founders who be like, you know, we have some capital, let's start a cloud kitchen. And now Swiggy is there to help us reach customers. We were very passionate about the e-commerce and D2C ecosystem. And that's how Club happened. Um, mm. as, in, as I was reshaping the next phase of my career, I felt very close to founders. I've been in the investment banking space and I felt like I needed to start something that genuinely helps other founders scale their business. And that's right. where the idea for club and the journey came on. And it's it's close to being three years since I decided of doing this. Uh, we've had incredibly blessed uh, journey over the last three years to build this, funded hundreds of companies. And you know we'll talk about that later, but yeah, yeah that's yeah. something. No, oh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's also really interesting that you had that exposure and uh, and an ecosystem that kind of gave you the the insight into you know and and built that excitement around uh, entrepreneurship early on, right? I think yes. that's uh, that's really something that takes takes you a long way, and uh, you know that's why you can you you might want to take a plunge earlier in in your life, right? So I'm curious when you decided to do this, uh, you might have given up a job and whatever, right? Uh, how did the so ecosystem around you, family, friends, how did they how did they re uh, react when you first decided to go down this path? Uh, was there social acceptance, excitement? What was what was that like? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. So I feel like my professional ecosystem was very supportive. All mm. of my uh, managers, bosses, uh, previous company CEOs, right? Like everybody I'd worked under were incredibly supportive. We wouldn't be here today if they didn't, uh, you know, so, you know, when I was pitching to them or when I was telling them, this is the idea, this is what I want to do. A lot of them were very, very generous with their time. Like my, all my managers at United States Capital have uh, helped at different points of time. All my friends at Kotak have helped at different points of time. So uh, couldn't have done it without them. I think from a friends and family perspective, it gets more interesting. Um, so for, for most of my friends, right, like think uh, I am a cohort, 10 plus years of experience. They're all sitting in large consulting firms or yeah. VC firms or PE firms or stuff like that. And um, there's a little bit of, they, they're a very well placed to provide support, right? Like I have an amazing peer network uh, that over the last few years, but at the same point of time, there's a little bit of, hey, you know, this is the opportunity cost. 
this is the yeah, CTP yeah. you've been making, or this is the, you know, you're up for that important promotion, you're on CXO track or partner track or whatever. And you would yeah. be giving that up and there's no getting it back. And there was a little bit of, you know, just the opportunity cost of somebody doing it much later in life. And my, my friends made sure that this is not some like, you know, glorified version of a midlife crisis that I just want to do something interesting, but it's a well thought through sensible decision that aligns with my values, my career plans. Uh, family is interesting. So mom is uh, an entrepreneur herself. She's a doctor and she runs a small hospital. So she is always believed in this, you know, being her own boss sort of thing. So there was a lot more acceptance. Dad um, does a job for a living. So he was like, you know, it, it's very funny after like seven, eight months of starting up, he would still ask me every month if I'm doing okay on cash and if he can support me in any way, because now he thought I'd started up. So overall, I would say people added value to that conversation decision in different ways. I didn't feel dissuaded by any. I felt like there was a healthy balance of testing my assumptions. Are you doing this for the right reasons? I have you thought right. this through um, instead and, and sort of once they, once I could satisfy their concerns, there was a lot of support and I couldn't have done it without everybody. Right. Right. Interesting. You made a point about, you know, having the friends network and everyone kind of help you make an informed choice. Right. That makes me wonder, uh, there's a lot of talk about people going into entrepreneurship for different reasons, right? One could be, I am really passionate, I have a strong passion about a particular topic or a cause, therefore I go about it. Or I have a strong understanding of that space and I know how to deal with this space. Or three, I, I could just be someone with a keen eye to spot you know, gaps and opportunities. Uh, so it, I may not have any exposure to that field, but I am just, you know, good at figuring out gaps and opportunities and then solving for them, right? What, what are your thoughts? Is there, is one better than the other? Is there, have you also seen that people do this differently? What, what, in your case, I think it was a mix of a few things, uh, passion as well as a very informed decision. And you've also had experience in that space, right? What have you seen uh, that works uh, when people make the decision to go after a problem to solve? Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting that people do this for different reasons. A lot of people, um, and a lot of people do it for wrong reasons as well, of course. Yeah. But yeah. I think healthy intersection of this being something that you are passionate about, either as a product or a service or an area or a problem, right? Mm. Like, do you relate to the um, to the value prop or the problem? Are you, a, at, at some level, are you a customer yourself? I think that was very powerful for me that, as a startup founder, I felt like if I bring the right set of opportunities and resources, capital shouldn't be a hard problem. Um, mm. So I felt like some intersection of these three work well. And the analogy I sort of give is like, you could you could be an artist, but you could like hate to run an art gallery, right? Like it's not right. the same thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, advising founders in my personal capacity on their fundraising decisions, which is something I did in, like when I took a break from my main career, I was very different ball game than running this as now almost 100 people org and, uh, you know, uh, managing that. And and I do sometimes maybe let's say the passion, which was more, was better satisfied in one-on-one -on -one environments where I was an mm. advisor to people is not as satisfied today. So it needs to be mm. an intersection of, you know, why are you, what's really excites you about it? It does helping founders excite you great. Uh, is that, mm. does that is there a way to make money out of it? And I don't think enough people ask that question, right? right. Like India is an extremely hard execution market. I mean, you know, you're running a business here, you'll understand the execution challenges, thin margins, complexities, regulatory, yeah. uh, you know, sort of a very dynamic regulatory environment where the regulator is also, you know, sort of exploring different things and which means your understanding might be requalified at any point of time, all of those things. So a combination of this being something that you're determined to solve for a long enough horizon, there being an economic value prop loosely, I feel works best. Otherwise, if you're just passionate and there's no economic value prop, it's best done as some version of a side hustle or a hobby. Like I love right. to write, but I don't want to become a writer to pay my sort of right. And I force people to have that conversation. Who do you think will pay you for this? When, right? Um, is this scalable? Yeah. And I think a combination of those, you know, your personal vision statement and uh, a business vision statement there needs right. to be 
at least a 50 50 overlap otherwise you know startups don't succeed so that's how i would think about it interesting you mentioned uh, the kind of things that an entrepreneur or a business owner would go through and it's, i think it's it's much harder in a, a fintech or a finance field because it's subject to so much more regulation right uh, let's talk about club in that context uh, you came up with a proposition which is uh, different in india right uh, we have startups that are used to equity funding from venture capitals uh, maybe a little bit of debt funding, but even debt is not that big in India. Uh, you came with a very different model, which is somewhere in between the two, right? revenue-based yeah. financing. Uh, how how was how was the acceptance process? How hard was it uh, to kind of get this concept across, especially in the first year? Any moments that stood out in the early days of club? Sure. So I think from a customer's perspective, the acceptance was, was very high. Uh, in fact, I would say my wish list of customers, I I could crack like my first year, like your third wave coffee roasters yeah. and uh, things like that. Because that's a, the idea that for repeatable high ROI expenses where, you know, I can t- get different kinds of funding and I don't need to dilate equity first. So things like performance marketing, things like inventory spends, CapEx for another cloud kitchen, those sort of problem statements. Founders were like, this is not, this doesn't seem like a good use of equity. Right. Equity is for building technology brand but <coughs> alternatives so there was extremely uh interesting like early feedback and in fact before launching we did a anurag and i anurag, my co-founder and i met almost close to 100 founders to validate this mm. and uh we realized there was this was an instant hit which is how we zeroed down they helped us define the idea think about it i think it was a little bit more challenging to think of uh, to convince the ecosystem because the ecosystem understands equity, they understand the terminology, the risks, the challenges, the opportunities, then they understand debt. They understand a loan, an EMI, uh, collateral for the EMI. And they're like, what's this in the middle? This seems flexible. You don't have to pay me a fixed amount every month. But at the same point of time, you do have to pay me and I don't get an equity stake. Yeah. Um, it took a lot of education, I would say, for the ecosystem. So like, you know, working with our banking partners and BFC partners, some investors and educating them about why something like this with, is beneficial. And a lot of our first year actually went into figuring out regulatory feasibility. And we invested, um, I think, from idea to beta, it took us about a good eight, nine months. What did not help was that is also when the first wave of COVID hit. Mm. So we did our uh, first few transactions um, circa this January, February 2020, and we closed our uh, pre-seed round of funding. And we were uh, unfortunately forced to do all this um, evangelizing in an environment where banks and NBFCs were more risk averse than normal. So 2020 was a bad year for them. They were Their other businesses were understandably hit by uh, COVID-related things and telling them like, hey, revenue-based financing in an environment where half the customers are not making revenues. It was not easy. And I would still candidly admit that it set us back a few quarters uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, the customers were just sort of like, the brands were interested the, that we wanted to fund. The capital providers needed a lot more convincing. I think there just are, uh, you know, a tenacity help Going back to them month after month with data and, you know, like uh, our first NBFC partner, I think we'd been engaging for six to seven months and I was like sending them monthly data cuts and um, updates and they finally signed on and say November 2020 from February 2020. So in these environments, we've always felt, right, like the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So uh, we keep going back to people with data, with proof points and uh, you just have to stay at it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a. I mean, COVID would have been uh, the toughest journey for most people, right? I think a lot of people have taken tough calls at that point. Started might have even shut businesses down. I wonder uh, for any entrepreneur, this must happen. Maybe not the COVID levels of extreme uh, situations, but there must be many, many ups and downs and hard moments of truth uh, in any entrepreneur's journey, right? Uh, did you ever have in the in the in the journey of club, let's say, uh, any such moments where you were second guessing your decision uh, as to why you started this and uh, if there was any specific instance and how did you then come out of that because clearly you're doing really well uh, how did you come out of that uh, that sort of mind space yeah I mean honestly any founder will admit many hmm. I, I mean if any founder tells you that they get like they're really excited about what they do every hour of the day uh, 
you know they're not being truthful to either you or themselves so it is very challenging as a journey and um the highs have to outweigh the lows so you know the the gratification we get from doing the things we value and treasure which in my case is helping brand founders scale their businesses by providing them timely and flexible access to capital that is what keeps me going right like the number of businesses i can serve the number of employment it generates for them uh, that sort of stuff so when i look back it there have been multiple such sort of journeys obviously two three waves of covid were really really hard because not only were we unable to go out and do as much as we wanted in the market but all the portfolio companies were struggling with you know dealing with it and there was generally so much that the employees were struggling the team members were struggling i think i have i've come to realize that when you start to build a business and you know sort of you invest in different things it's really important to invest in yourself and a lot of people let it fall by the wayside they assume that whatever mental and physical makeup took them to point a to becoming say a successful employee will also scale to being a successful entrepreneur and it's been a tremendously steep learning curve from a personal development perspective because when that realization hit that you know this is a bad time and so many people are relying on me to not only uh, put up a brave face at work but reliant on me for different things right for either solving access to capital meeting payroll of their employees and i need to scale myself right and i have invested a lot in the last two years in very structured formats it's not mm-hmm. just a realization i mean i i keep telling people it takes a village to keep me this functional and uh, so for example simple things like taking care of your mental health taking care of your physical health uh, building peer support networks and i'm happy to deep dive on these topics but if i have one advice that there will be low moments your capacity yeah. to bounce back from those low moments is completely a function of how strong you feel and how grounded you feel uh, on a day to day basis which is something we need to invest every day in right right we mentioned some of the uh, the habits that you've developed what would you say are uh, are your leadership habits right uh, that have helped you at least in this entrepreneurial journey and perhaps even in your senior corporate roles before uh, what were what, i mean there's that you know these habits have been talked about a lot the seven habits of if highly effective people what are your maybe not seven but three habits that you would think are uh, really critical to your success yeah so i'll divide these actually into what you would call professional way of working and and more personal things because mm-hmm. you know as a founder it's equally um it's a equally challenging ride on both fronts it's not just about doing your work well but it's also keeping yourself stable and uh, you know being present for your customers and employees so on a professional front i have realized that structure really helps uh, by structure i mean that uh, articulating things so like we have a very uh, like as amazon calls it right? like a memo culture not a meeting culture so we like to write right. things down we like to uh, you know ponder over things internally in documentation so structured thinking is one of our most like you know sort of prided upon values here at club and i think that has helped us build in a complex regulatory and an economic environment because uh, the first principles thinking that some of my colleagues in in exhibit not while not just innovating but also responding to different crisis situations is right. exemplary and i think it comes from a place of tremendous structure thinking i think the second thing um that i think personally i have done that really helps is uh just more resilience which mm. in terms of habits translates into uh, some version of meditative practice every day i mean i don't have the patience for more than 7 to 9 minutes so i end up doing 7 to 9 minutes but some uh, for a lot, a lot it has varied at different phases in my career but you need a reflection mechanism you need a way to uh like sort of empty the mental sink and reflect and reset your brain at a high enough mm-hmm. frequency because otherwise the noise can really uh bog you down as a senior corporate leader as well. so i i mean i do a combination of meditation journaling uh talking to my colleagues alignment discussions we formally call them reflect and resets so you know th- these this discussion that helps and the third thing that has helped me i think tremendously is just having and it sounds counterintuitive but having something outside of club that i really like because when something is your world 
it becomes very difficult to be objective about decision making and when i tell people you know it's important to like have a hobby outside of work something that you really care about and even if the day at club goes bad the day for that particular thing so if i had to just i mean given you know three habits one would definitely be um, bring more structure to you workplace make sure vision mission alignment project tracking all of this is not happening at a very high level but you are hiring a lot of first principle structured thinkers to execute in a complex environment the second thing would be have a daily meditative practice it's different for different people some people run some people meditate and the third would be invest in something that's not your primary you know sort of career it could be reading it could be working out again different for different people i think these have kept me incredibly stable uh that's great yeah that's great i think there is super practical uh, tips to actually keeping yourself uh, in the right zone i think that's that's amazing let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk more about the diversity agenda right uh, you've been in the finance industry pretty much all your career uh, and the, this industry specifically is quite heavily male dominated uh, i was reading a report uh, from deloitte i think uh, in 2021 there's a report that's come out which basically talks about specifically in the uh, in the fsi sector uh, you know the gender gap uh, issue that exists and more so at the senior levels right uh, so I, i think if i remember the statistic correctly it said something that the pipeline gap between c level positions and senior leadership positions uh, will increase uh, from 9% to 14% for for women if there are no corrective actions taken to make sure that you know there's a path path to the to the top right uh, in india although while this is true in india we've seen a lot of large banks have uh, women ceos uh, shikha sharma kalpana murpari like we've got role models in india right so is india different in any way or is, uh, is this when you think of it systemic, systemically it's the same in india and what can be done to actually in, increase the representation of women uh, in the financial services industry yeah now this is something we talk about often enough in just to improve them within club narrowly so i'm happy to share some thoughts one thing is that while we have a few very visible figures by percentage there aren't i mean just because right. we have so few we know their names and we we know their careers but uh, it's just not enough so yeah, building yeah. more aspiration goes a long way uh, you know does does it girl studying finance think that i'm going to be a bank chairman one day is that a practical career path that they expi- is like sort of that inspires them today i would say no and it starts very small the career nudges we start getting from family from you know uh, just the di- the difference between the number of female doctors versus female engineers right like small mm-hmm. nudges so building aspiration is very important making sure that there are women out there at at every point in their careers right like i mean if you're an analyst i don't know if a ceo inspires you you need to see a well functioning senior associate or a manager right. and you want to get there and you know there, there's a whole ladder so making sure that we have exceptional women professional at all and building aspirational at every, aspiration at every level is helpful that is something we try to do um, internally at club as well so like we have actually a um, a group that does a monthly events to promote our uh, leadership at every level uh, mm-hmm. amongst when we talk about issues like imposter syndrome representation language using sexist language which makes some certain and we we discuss this we make sure that we're letting people know that there are things that hinder progress and these are the things you want yeah. i think the second thing is there is a hard top of the funnel problem when it comes to recruitment you know as I, i'm sure I, i'm preaching to the choir here but if you want to um uh, you know even if as an organization that has a dei mandate and thinks about these things it's really difficult when it comes to marrying uh, the twin objectives of getting the uh, a timely closure of yeah. um, a particular position and then you know seeing hey 900 applications like less than 50 are uh, female so one of the things we want organizations to we've started doing is we need to showcase women more when we talk about the company and we've started making a deliberate attempt in our marketing in our social media because women need to apply first right like right. unfortunately if you're doing an outbound if you're doing head hunting those sort of environments you can make sure there is some ratio but right. how do you solve the inbound problem uh, you need to the organization needs to have a face which is recognizable with 
the women who lead it if you don't have somebody at a founder layer do you have somebody at a manager layer do you have a spokesperson can your branding be more uh, you know sort of helpful because women need to feel like they belong in this environment and that's when they'll apply yeah. and so i think our our cumulative like thing is build more aspiration demonstrate to women uh, by you know sort of various object uh, either uh, initiatives or uh, policies that demonstrate that we want them in the leadership roles and we are rooting for them and we'll help them the second is uh, just the marketing branding how we how we represent the brand and that it's very much uh, you know an environment where they'll be welcome i think those yeah. have helped us tremendously like our ratios are better than industry averages today and these two factors have definitely helped and that's really interesting that I, and i'm wondering i guess this is because we, you, there is a woman founder at club that this is a topic right but a lot of times in the startup ecosystem this is not even a topic you might have this as a topic uh, that okay we need to increase the diversity pool or get high quality talent at at different levels of the organization at mncs and large organizations uh, but at in at the startup where where the focus is growth uh, where the focus is revenue uh, and it's kind of chaotic as you said hiring is also quite chaotic when you when you go into the startup ecosystem it's not even a topic of discussion many times so i'm really glad to hear that at club it is the topic of discussion it's probably because uh, there is a woman founder over here what is your experience been uh, looking at other startups uh, in 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 india you know th- i mean unfortunately that is a little bit true that uh, because not only i mean i don't make up the entire group right so not only am i there but there are enough other leaders you know uh, that are there who created the space for for uh, this to be a conversation for this to be a push um yeah, i completely sort of you know i'm i'm not saying i condone it but i completely empathize that startup founders have so many like yeah. you know conflicting priorities that if you're a guy and you know this is not something you've you've handled before and it's it's not something you miss or do you think about it and maybe yeah. you want more equality but you don't know how to get there and amongst all the priorities of growth yeah. and, you know runway this falls by the wayside i re- i i mean i can empathize why that happens but yes it's a conversation that i feel like a lot of organizations are having now they um candidates test us right like you know candidates ask who you know how what sort of how many women are there at the leadership level and things like that and the market has become more interesting and woke and that's great because they push us to be better and hold ourselves to better standards than uh, we would hold ourselves as uh, startup founders with so kudos to the generation as well that uh, you know the younger generation but yes it is a conversation startup that falls either by the wayside or what i call lip service get paid so mm. which means that there'll be women but not women in leadership so mm. ultimately you know um there are certain professions let's say which attract more women than men and they'll be like okay you know we can meet this quote and quote numbers by you know it's not like a horizontal activity for them it's not a conversation with every team that how can we help you get to more balanced uh, uh, ratios these are the advantages like the diversity right. of ideas the diversity of you know our skill sets and the complementarity if your customers are both men and women we need to represent them yeah. here internally yeah. um so yeah we try not to be lip service to it we don't have like percentages but i feel like this is a conversation that i've recently seen a lot more startups have uh but yes you're right that this probably if if the founders do not either personally perceive this to be a value add or whatever it's not likely to happen given it has to come from the top it's very yeah. hard to organize this organically from uh, the team itself yeah yeah no oh, absolutely and it's it's really heartening to hear that you are seeing that happen in in the startup ecosystem that's that's quite nice to hear I mean, you must have i mean uh, interacted with a lot of women uh, founders there are not that many but uh, i'm sure you've in, interacted with a few do you see a common set of qualities uh, that women founders have that you share with them uh, and is that different from what you see in the male founders or is it more or less the same it's just what it takes to be an entrepreneur yeah no that's very interesting i think there's a there's definitely a slightly higher degree of um, what i would call uh, care that goes into it mm-hmm. i've seen like they're extremely nuanced and the attention to detail about all things brand all things customer is definitely you know anecdotally i'm i'm like uh, i'm thinking of like my five six other founder female friends and how are they different uh, so that's definitely i think they're very passionate 
about mm. uh, what they do not to say my male colleagues aren't and it shows in sort of the ways they really care about how every aspect of their business and brand interacts with the real world and i think i really value that um the the second thing is i think mostly that their challenges have been different mm. right like in the past it takes a little more for women to reach the same spot than men theoretically so um i also find them a lot more resilient mm. um you know uh, and just thinking long term thinking uh, you know they just more used to dealing with setbacks or things that would like throw some of my again very anecdotally male founder friends off the, the women somehow seem to take it in their stride which seems interesting but yeah it's obviously a gross generalization from a very small sample right right so that that's interesting that's interesting i was wondering if there is um uh, there are these qualities that you talked about uh, but i'm wondering also if there is a difference in the journey of a of a of a female founder versus male founders in india right whether it's from a fundraising point of view or from a hiring point of view do you think it's different uh, for uh, for female founders versus um, male founders i mean i noticed one stark difference and i'm not sure it's a problem for the ecosystem to solve but just the idea of peer networks is very missing for women mm. um men network right like the network as a part of their professional journey whether it's peers within uh, their company it's peers in other companies customers uh, partners right like it's just a very um and the space is provided to them yeah so, you know uh, whether it's connecting over drinks or brunches or whatever right like there are enough curated spaces just just the chai smoke breaks that happen in different companies right, right. men pr- get provided a lot more opportunities to build peer networks and they uh, utilize those opportunities better which means that when it comes to important transitions uh, getting a warm connect for somebody getting a promotion right like you know, those things matter building peer networks in the ecosystem matter i think women a because structurally all of these opportunities are so designed that they they take time away from home like yeah. not all women can go on a four day conference especially if you have kids to a different location and all of that and I, over the years what i saw was um the a the number of opportunities for women to build peer networks was um, different i wouldn't say lesser right. and they weren't necessarily designed for women so you know like yeah. drinking you did drinking environments are unsuitable maybe right. it might environments are unsuitable maybe things that require you to travel away from home are unsuitable and all of that right like as you start right. thinking about mid career women and uh, nobody is really designing that and this it is changing now there are a couple of very interesting startups that again you know invest in women building professional and peer networks and they're doing really well and and i think the third is the you know you can't just blame the ecosystem there hasn't like i don't think women invested in peer networks for a very long time yeah. maybe there weren't enough women peers available for them to network and i think that's one thing that cuts across multiple dimensions of enabling you right like just when you need the right advice uh, whether you need a introduction to a company you're applying to whether you need an introduction to a vc yeah uh, you need people who will say hey you know i know you shita and you know i think you should hear what she has to say right uh, and that was is filling any form online right yeah. like the, so i i try to tell my colleagues so that's important it's something that you need to invest in you need to have sort of uh this is how you get feedback from other right. people about how your growth is versus other people's growth is what's happening in the market and if there is one thing that i feel like has been a difference in how men handle their careers and how i've seen some of women just systematically you know doing everything at work but not doing just this one piece outside of work that would take them to the next level so you know i think like the whole lean in concept yeah, people need yeah. to recognize this is really own important it. and yeah. yeah own it and say yeah. hey i'm, I'm going to go out there and and understand what my peers are doing what my seniors are doing and how can i learn from it and take, take it to the next level yeah and it's really important one is the peer network uh, the other is the mentor Uh, pool that you should you know always have and keep growing that right i, I wonder who are your mentors uh, ishita rai who, who are the people you look up to um, and how did you go about building that relationship where you could just you know pick up the phone and call someone for advice uh, whenever you were stuck 
yeah my mentors are all almost all of my old uh, bosses like my managers at my previous jobs they are the people who are like on a speed dial and i can pick up the phone and talk i find that best because they they understand me so they know what advice at what mm-hmm. point of point would work for me otherwise it ends up being really generic yeah it's uh, you know and I, i i find the applicability and they also like they can push me a little bit to test my assumptions are you are you are you sure like do you really want this right like just that one level of forcing me to do second order thinking um so it uh, i mean i have built it by just working under them making uh, you know making sure that they were aware of my career goals reaching out to them building that relationship incidentally some of those conversations have become a little two way that you know uh, they're like oh you know you've been free me eating my brain for 6 months now mm-hmm. i want to do this you tell me how to do this so it's it's interesting that sometimes the mentors also want a soundboard and i've invested in building relationship with my managers making sure my transitions from those things were very clear and i could explain that hey i'm you know i'm 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 very invested in what you're doing but i want to build something of my own i want you to support me and and investing in that plus keeping them updated about what's happening so not only reaching out to them when i need something but yeah. also you know uh, making sure that at least they get some inputs from me every quarter just top of mind because if they're invested in my progress i can't only be you know reaching out to them and i need something you know yeah. i need to uh, thank them for the the good times as well and yeah. I, if that's not available like let's assume you're just fresh and you know sort of you don't have any old managers or said i mean professional coaches are great i have a, a professional coach as <laughs> well and she acts like a friend philosopher guide uh, you know like all at all days and times and that's also i mean i mean it's obviously a professional equation but she also yes. serves as a mentor when i'm making difficult decisions yeah it's the, i think the point is to have a sounding board of some form somewhere and a sane sounding board someone who yes. who advise you can trust and i i think you really made a great point about keeping in touch when you don't need them because i think that's where a lot of times people lose the plot uh, you kind of only reach out uh, when you when you need and then uh, over a period of time that relationship won't uh, won't flourish as much right i think that's a great point i, I hope people take that uh, as a big takeaway from this conversation uh, talking about takeaways i'll come to my final two questions to you uh, ishita uh, we're living away in a very complex world with inflation and what not happening around right now um, financial literacy is a core life skill right uh, and especially for women because one woman usually influences the entire family right one one woman actually has such a huge impact uh, on the entire social fabric of a, of a society right uh, so what are the things that you would suggest women in general must do uh, early in their career mid life uh, and later on to become more financially literate i mean it's never too late to start i guess so uh, what what would you suggest they they do to be financially literate got it the first thing is i think people uh, women specifically tend to cede ownership of their financial discussions either mm-hmm. completely to like male family members i've seen this pattern in my family and i don't know if it exists in other families but you know like my mom's investment my dad will sort of advise right. her on my sister when she started making money she asked my dad where to invest things like that and women uh, find it and again maybe a generalization but it, there is just that they just feel like this is something that we can be best handled by somebody yeah. if and and they they feel it's complex as you said uh i want to nudge everybody to take ownership of their economic decisions right yeah. if you're joining a job if you have a certain savings your certain expenses you know somebody is relying on you to do very important work at work this is simple you need to just have a simple excel sheet of what are my basic expenses rent etc etc you know like this much shopping a month this much rent this much education loan emi yeah. start with the basics take ownership of your economic decisions feel free to keep them at a level of simplicity that you can absorb so you don't have to over complicate and start doing 15 kinds of investments in the first month but the first thing is to build confidence ki hey these are this is my hard earned money and right. i want to have uh, ownership of decisions that go into it once you start building familiarity there are enough source so one is that you need to just have visibility right like how much do you make where does it go are there enough apps that will help you do that today but just knowing that information is very empowering because you can make long term investment decisions <coughs> the second is where do you you know if if there is a 
some money left over at the end and how do you plan to have better savings where do you invest again a lot of people get confused there are x stocks and mutual funds and index funds and debt funds what does all of this mean again go to any good app right like do, i'm not even going to plug club into this go to like yeah. any yeah. mutual fund investing app right like your grower script box or whatever they've solved it right customers like us they'll tell you if you make this much these are your uh, return expectations but it needs effort and it needs this mindset that these are my decisions and i'm going to own them and that the same self we bring to our professional work we need to bring the same self to our financial decisions and have ownership over it um right. you know if i mean five there are none of all of these questions can get answered by 5 minutes of googling so that's an earlier career advice have visibility on your um spends savings investment options i think mid to late career what i start encouraging people to do is um get somebody to manage your money i mean it's a oversimplification again but when the complexity starts increasing again there is this urge to seed control and say i'll let my husband handle it i'll let my father or father in law handle it or things like that right and that's when i think independent financial advice comes in handy there are enough banks and enough financial services houses once you have a certain corpus in a few lakhs mid to late career professionals they'll they'll offer you good advice and uh, participate in that process push their right. assumptions you know um don't i mean if i had to generalize the advice would be it's very hard to give like sound financial advice in like 30 second nuggets but a don't let the complexity bother you you're a smart talented professional working somewhere responsible for big professional decisions this is not complicated you right. if you can handle right. that you can handle this don't let the complexity bother you with any investment or financial service provider where you feel a little deterred by just think about it they owe you the information feel free to push back ask 20 questions they owe you information as a financial service provider get your doubts clarified um and i think just these two things right like if you start thinking about this is this is my money my decision i'm going to learn more about this the mindset shift will start happening yeah. and then you the google in the world of internet has solved information right right and i think that's the key right not being intimidated by financial planning a lot of people are just walking away from it because it sounds like complicated stuff yeah it sounds boring but yeah, and boring right exactly yeah. exactly but talking about intimidating things i think last piece of uh, piece of advice that you would want to leave our audience with in terms of anyone who's any woman out there who wants to start a business what would you tell uh, as your mantra or your pieces of advice for them Sure. So, find one thing is that it's definitely going to be an interesting but challenging experience to so find something that excites you by itself. Like you would do this even if it they weren't paying you to do this, right? Hmm. So, find that intersection of what I would call passion and um, skill sets and the economic value prop of the business. So, it has to be something you like doing. It has to be something that other people want. and there it has to be monetizable in some way to make money ikigai concept uh, yeah for a startup like, yes yeah, some yeah, version exactly. thereof right yeah. the second is build yourself it a lot of people once you start a business a lot of people are going to count on you to deliver on different dimensions right like it could be employees uh, expecting leadership <laughs> um expecting economic outcomes customers expecting something partners expecting something so build yourself uh think about what will it take for you to run this challenging thing for 5 to 7 years is it a better body is it a better mind is it a better work life equation is it a better relationship uh, what does it take because it's i feel like the first conversation is still easy and most people have it yeah. second conversation most people don't so build, investing in yourself mental physical spiritual relationship community all of these are incredibly important and do you have the right support system so one is like and i would call the the take guy as you said i'll borrow it as the foundation but all of these things are actually the scaffolding for the building right. you can build like two floors with the foundation but you can't build 10 floors without that scaffolding right so you have to invest in yourself finding that co i mean you, you talked to me a great point about mentors and coaches we talked about peer networks we talked about having some sort of personal runway knowing yeah. how much can you invest in the business how long can you last without a paycheck so investing in yourself and all dimensions yourself and and coming to you know is I, my business idea seems ready but am i ready to own this business idea and take it to the next level have those conversations and 
you know and and, and this is fairly gender agnostic advice honestly yeah, true yeah, so, yeah, yeah 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 absolutely fantastic that's i think great advice i hope the audience uh, that tunes into this uh, learns a lot from this uh, very practical candid conversation i think some of the key takeaways that if i had to summarize for for women going down or exploring the path of entrepreneurship is own it own your career own your financial independence own your financial investments build authentic networks i would say invest in yourself Uh, and find that intersection of passion and uh, and business and practicality uh, that can then be a long term career or a option for you so on that note ishita thank you so much for taking the time really appreciate it uh, thanks uh, for very very uh, candid conversations and i uh, i hope we stay connected in the future as well with monster yeah thanks for having me i really enjoyed chatting about this and i hope some people find it useful I'm sure they will. Thank you so much and thanks everyone for tuning in. Stay tuned to Monster and Triumph. Thanks a lot guys. That was a truly incredible discussion and I'm sure this conversation has inspired many potential women entrepreneurs to take that leap and pursue their business goals. Thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with us Ishita.